Working with limits leads us directly into an important conversation around the topic of continuity. So we're going to answer the question, when is a function continuous? Well, in order to determine when the function is or is not continuous, we need to know what continuous means. Uh, first, kind of an informal definition. The idea of continuous means basically I can draw the graph without lifting my pencil. It's just a continuous a curve without lifting the pencil for a gap or a jump or an asymptote. It's just continuous. Now, a more formal mathematical definition states that a continuous function will satisfy three conditions for all points. And we'll call those points A. The first condition is that f of A is defined. So the function can't be undefined at the given point. In addition, we need the limit as x approaches a of f of x to exist. So for example, if the function's approaching two different numbers from two different sides, the, the limit does not exist. But the all important one that we probably go to to check the most for continuity is that the limit as x approaches a of f of x is actually equal to whatever f of a is. In other words, we can do the direct substitution to calculate the limit because the limit is equal to the point itself. These three definitions, and specifically this last one being the most important, are what makes a function continuous. So what does it mean to be discontinuous or not a continuous function? Well, there are actually three types of discontinuity, which means not continuous. The first type of discontinuity is what we call a removable discontinuity. And here's what a removable discontinuity looks like. It's something like f of x equals x squared plus x minus 12 over x minus 3. Notice if we tried to calculate f of 3 or just directly substitute the 3 in, we would get 3 squared plus 3 minus 12, which is 0, divided by the important part, 3 minus 3 is 0, and we can't divide by 0. So f of x, or f of a, f of 3 is undefined. However, if I took my function and I factored it, we'd get what? 4 and 3. It's plus 4 and minus 3 over x minus 3. We can then divide out the x minus 3, and we've removed the discontinuity or the problem. Now, because we've been able to remove the discontinuity, we could calculate the limit. So this is a removable discontinuity because we were able to algebraically remove the part that was discontinuous. Now, the way this looks on a graph, and we'll go ahead and just graph this same function. Let 
not to scale here so we'll come up and call this 4 here but the idea is this graph's going to go through 4 and it's going to have a hole that's been removed right at 3 that it goes around we can't graph this without lifting our pencil because we have to lift our pencil at the hole in the graph so we could say that the hole in the graph is removable it is a removable discontinuity the first type of discontinuity The second type of discontinuity that we're going to look at is called an infinite discontinuity. And the example we're going to use here is f of x is equal to x minus 3 over x plus 1. we would end up with uh, a vertical asymptote at 1. And there's actually also a horizontal asymptote at 1. So this graph looks like this. No, it doesn't. It looks like this. But specifically, what we find is the infinite discontinuity. So that is our second type of discontinuity. The third type of discontinuity is what we call a jump discontinuity. And it does exactly what you'd expect the graph to do. It jumps. So if we have f of x equals the piecewise function x squared minus 1 for x less than 1 and x plus 1 for x greater than or equal to 1, what we're going to find is the limit, again, is not going to exist. Because if we take the limit as x goes to 1 from the left, or smaller values, we use the first equation. So we'll directly substitute 1 into x squared minus 1. And we get 1 squared minus 1, which is 0. And we compare that to the limit coming in from the right of 1. Well, coming in from the right, we want the bigger values. So we'll plug it into x plus 1, or 1 plus 1, which is 2. And because these are not the same, we have a jump in the graph. And the limit, as x approaches 1, again, does not exist. What does this look like as a graph? Just like you'd expect it to. It's x squared minus 1. So it's going to come, whoops, different color. The graph's going to come down. And then we've got a jump at 1. And then it turns into the line. But specifically, what we're interested in is the graph jumps. So again, the whole idea of discontinuity versus continuity is can you draw the graph without lifting your pencil? Specifically, does the function at a equal the limit as x approaches a? Kind of a corollary that comes out of this idea of continuity is this idea of what we call the intermediate value theorem, which is often abbreviated with the first letters IVT, intermediate value 
theorem. And what the intermediate value theorem says is that if a function f of x is continuous, if the function always equals its limit on some interval from a to b, and there's another number z that's between f of a and f of b, then there exists another number, we'll call it c, that is in a, b such that f of c will equal that z. OK, that definition is really weird. Let's draw a picture that really illustrates what this means. I've got a graph. We're going to go from a to c, a to b, sorry. So the graph goes from a to b. Let's say a is down low, b is up high, and it might do something interesting and crazy. But it's continuous, so I can draw it without lifting my pencil and go all the way from a to b. Well, a hits at f of a, and b hits up on top at f of b. The idea of the intermediate value theorem is I can pick any z that is between f of a and f of b, any z I want. And wherever I pick that z, there is a guarantee that there will be a solution, some c, that will get me that solution. In fact, there could be more than one solution. If I pick a z kind of down towards the center, you see there's three solutions in there. But there's always at least one solution for any z that's in the middle of those. Basically, we're going to hit every single value all the way up from f of a to f of b, because there's no other way to connect the dots. Now, there's a couple cautions about what this theorem actually says. So before we get to an example of how to use it, I want to make sure we clearly understand what this is actually saying. First, the definition started out that if f is continuous, this does not work. if f is not continuous. But it could. We just don't have the guarantee that we get from continuity. So drawing a picture of what I mean by that, here we've got a, here we've got b. So there's a point at A, and there's a point at B. So we've got f of B and f of A. The intermediate value theorem says that I can pick any z in between f of A and f of B, as long as it's continuous. But if this function just kind of goes like this, and then there's a jump discontinuity, and it goes like that. Notice if I pick a z right in the middle of that jump discontinuity, I do not get a solution. I could, if I picked a z up high enough, that it actually hit the graph. I could get a result, but I'm not guaranteed a result because of that jump discontinuity. So it does not work if f 
is not continuous. The other important thing is it does not work if z is outside of f of a and f of b. But it could. Again, it could work. We just don't have that guarantee. So again, we're going to go from a to b. a's here, b's here, which means f of a is at the lower point where a is f of b at the higher point. And if f of a is connected somehow, but my z is too low or too high, I'm not guaranteed that it's going to work, that I'm going to cross the graph. It doesn't necessarily mean no, though, because if the graph did go up and down and really wiggle, it could go down and hit z. But I don't have any guarantee that it does. So it's really important for the intermediate value theorem that z has to be between the two y values. The one other thing this tells us, this theorem only tells us there is at least one solution. There may or may not be more. And I kind of hinted at this with my original drawing. But again, we've got A and we've got B. Put A down low and B up high, and the graph is going to wiggle. But specifically, f of A aligns with A, and f of B aligns with B. And if I pick Z in the middle of this graph, what you'll see is I actually get one, two, three solutions. So there's actually three points that work that could be our C. We are guaranteed with the intermediate value theorem that there is at least one solution for z. There could be more, but we have no way of knowing if there is or is not more. So that's really what this intermediate value theorem is trying to say is if f of x is continuous and our z is somewhere between those y values of f of a and f of b, then there exists at least one c such that when we plug c into the function, we get z for a solution. How do we use this? Well, here's how we use this. We use this to show that we do have solutions to functions, even if we can't solve them. We can show that 0 equals 1 over x plus sine x has at least 1 solution we know this function is continuous except at 0 so we're going to stay away from 0 so that we're continuous between our a and our b in order to show that it has one solution what we're going to attempt to do a solution happens at 0, it says. What we're going to attempt to do is find the point where the graph crosses 0. 
Notice before 0, the graph is negative. After 0, this graph is positive. 0 is going to be between negative and positive. So if I can show that there is a solution that's negative, and that this guy has a solution that's positive, everything between it, including 0, must exist. Well, one thing we know about sine is where is sine positive? We're going to add sine of x. Well, sine is the y-coordinate on the unit circle. So if I imagine my unit circle. The y-coordinate is positive. So let's make a note of what we're doing here. We are going, we need to find a negative and positive solution. Or better than saying solution, let's say output for f of x. And then 0 between it must exist as an output. So on the unit circle, sine, sine is the y-coordinate. The y-coordinate, I notice, is very positive up here on top. That's at pi over 2. And it's also very negative down here at the bottom at 3 pi over 2. Let's see what those give us when we plug them in. So let's find f of pi over 2, which is equal to 1 over pi over 2 plus the sine of pi over 2. 1 over pi over 2, that's the reciprocal. So we have 2 over pi plus the sine of pi over 2 is 1. That's definitely positive. Actually, if I put it in my calculator, I get 1.64 or so. Then the other point to try and get negative, we said the most negative point for sine is at 3 pi over 2. So let's see what that gives us. 1 over 3 pi over 2 plus the sine of 3 pi over 2 is equal to, well, the reciprocal of 3 pi over 2 is 2 over 3 pi plus the sine of 3 pi over 2 is negative 1. And sure enough, that's negative 0.78. Eight. Therefore, by the way, these three triangles, these three dots in a triangle, that means therefore. It's a nice shorthand for mathematicians. Therefore, we know that all outputs between 1.64 and negative 0.788 are possible. Specifically, they're possible when x is between 3 pi over 2 and pi over 2. Therefore, 0, which is between those values, is a solution. So the intermediate value theorem tells us that there has to be a result, an output, between 1.64 and negative 0.788. 0 is between there. Therefore, 0 is a solution.
That's a quick look at continuity and the intermediate value theorem. Take a look at uh, some of the problems in your book to practice this a bit, but I'll look forward to seeing you in class so we can talk about continuity a little bit more.